Welcome to Come Follow Me. Today we're going to talk about Doctrine and Covenants section 3 through 5. Thank you, Daddy. We have some really interesting things happening here. I'm going to go through a little bit of the history. You guys pipe in anything that you remember as we read a few things this week. Uh, a lot of this actually comes from the history of Joseph Smith by his mother, Lucy Mack Smith. She records quite a few things. There's some in the history of the church also uh, written by Joseph Smith, that seven volume series. So these, these are vital books for understanding what some of the history was, the events were surrounding this and who the people were. Because prior to this, this area, Joseph had just gotten the plates, right? And so he actually sent his mother over to lose um, Martin Harris's house to let him know that he had the plates. She did not want to go. Do you remember why she didn't want to go? She didn't want to deal with Lucy, Lucy Harris. Harris. She really didn't want to deal with Lucy. <laughs> but she went because Joseph requested it. And one of the interesting things is Lucy Harris had this tendency to overstep her boundaries and her responsibilities. She kept trying to give money to Lucy Smith. And um, then she said, I'm coming out to the house with him and I'll be staying overnight. Let you know, all this kind of stuff. And. When she came to the house, she's trying to force Joseph to show her the plates. She's trying to force money on him. She's like, I need to know if this is real or not. And she had a dream that night because she'd been quite Im impertinent to him and very rude. And she had a dream in which she was told that she was being incorrect in her actions and was shown the plates and told not to be that way. Right. Or at least said she That's said she time. had a dream, right? She, she at least said she had a dream, but really, really interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so Joseph finally, just to get her to be quiet, agrees to take $28 from her. Okay. So we have this kind of a person in our mix here. That was a little funny to me. It's almost like, okay, just give me the money and go away. <laughs> yeah, it was, kind of, it was kind of that thing, right? The impertinence, the inappropriateness of her behavior towards him, all of that. And so she did go, but she didn't, of course, get her viewing of the plates. When Joseph and Emma went down to Harmony, Martin gives them $50, right? And he actually said, I give this to you. No, I don't give it to you. I give it to the Lord. And Emma's brother is there. And so in the presence of many witnesses, Martin's, you know, does this and then they sign that he said that he didn't even want anything back from it. He just wanted to give this money for the work. And so that was what allowed Joseph and Emma to go down to Harmony. And that, you know, last week we talked about the characters. He copied some characters. Martin Harris carried those off to New York. But then Martin Harris is at a point with his farm that he's got a year where he really just doesn't have to do anything. So he comes down, he does some translating with Joseph. And he begs him to go to the Lord through the Urim and Thummim to please ask if I can take these back and show them to some people. He's getting a lot of pushback from family, especially Lucy, his wife, right? So he, of course, the Lord says, no, that would not be a good idea. The, the, the manuscript pages will not be safe in that man's hands. And he begs him again. And Joseph asks again, second time. The answer is no. 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 And he begs him for a third time. And the third time the answer is? Fine. <laughs> you can, but you are responsible for those plates, right? So he asks and requires Martin to sign a covenant. The Lord tells him exactly who can see them. There were five people that were allowed to see them. They were members of his household, one of them being Lucy, one of them being his brother-in-law, his sister-in-law. I can't remember the other two. But there I were, think it was mother or father. Both can't, remember, can't remember, but very specific people that he was allowed to show them to and none else. And he signed a covenant with Joseph and the Lord that he would not show them to anyone else. And so he takes them. In the meantime, Emma's pregnant with her first child. She has the baby. The baby dies. Emma's really sick. So he's night and day watching over Emma, buries the baby, all the things that have to be done, right? And he's worried about Martin not coming back because it took longer than it should have. But he's not saying anything to Emma. He's not trying to give her any worry. But she finally asks the question and assures him that she'll be fine to get her mother to stay with her and that he should go find out what happened. So he catches the next stage to Palmyra. 
And the stage dropped off, I think it was 20 miles from the house. And there was one person on the stage with him. And this is all told in um, chapter 23 or 24 in Lucy's uh, history of Joseph. And he could tell that Joseph was distraught and he's trying to figure out what's the matter. And he, he Joseph just tells him, you know, I have lost a baby and my wife is really sick and I'm worried about them, which is true. But he didn't feel to share the other portion of it. And then uh, as Joseph gets ready to get off the stages, I've been watching you and you are in no condition. Because Joseph said, I, I need to walk the 20 miles to the house tonight. It's 10 o'clock at night. He says, you are in no condition to make that by yourself. I will go with you. And he asks him again, what is wrong? And he just gives him the same story. He can't, doesn't feel comfortable talking about the plates or the manuscript. And this stranger walks with him that full time. And it was interesting to me, like, they get to the house and this guy that's been walking with Joseph is leading mm -hmm. Joseph by like the arm. Yeah. And he says there were several times that he would fall asleep while walking. Yeah. He was so tired and fatigued. Yeah. So tired and fatigued that he was falling asleep while walking. I can't even imagine being that tired. So he gives, you know, Mother Smith some instructions, get him some pepper tea to warm his stomach, get him some food. If you would mind giving me some breakfast, I need to get back to the stage. So she feeds him, tries to take care of Joseph, makes breakfast. The first thing Joseph asks is send for Martin. Now, normally Martin's Johnny on the spot. He's there as soon as they call for him. Four and a half hours later. Yeah, they would have been waiting for breakfast with this guy. <laughs> yeah, four and a half hours later, he comes wandering very slowly down the lane, doesn't even come into the house, sits on the fence, and just covers his face with his hat. Finally comes in, they sit down to breakfast. He picks up his utensils and he puts them down. And Harm says, what's the matter, Martin? And he says, oh, I am lost. I am lost. And Martin, and Joseph at that point is like, don't tell me that you've lost the manuscript. And he, and he, and the whole house is mourning. Joseph is mourning and walking back and forth. I'm lost. My work is gone. And, and then the Lord is going to be very displeased with me. I am worthy of every every rebuke that the angel could give to me because I did not take him seriously when he told me to, that I shouldn't, I shouldn't have kept asking him. I needed to keep those with me, that they were not safe out of my hands. And back and forth and weeping and groaning, the whole house is so and distraught. Lucy says that none were as bad as Joseph was. Right, right. And he says, oh, Martin, let's go back to your house. Let's see if we can find him. And that's when Martin shares, well, I shared them just with those five you said. And then my wife let me lock them in her cabinet. And we went to visit some family. And when I got back, I, he came back without her. And someone came by and he wanted to show them to him. Not someone he was allowed to show them to. He actually goes and picks the lock and destroys his wife's desk, getting the, Man, the manuscript papers ticked. out. And it made her so mad when she found that. And he just kept doing that. Anybody who stopped in who was interested, he'd show them to. And he did not know they were gone until the morning Joseph called for him. The morning Joseph called for him, he went to where they were. They weren't there. And he searched the house he high and low. He turned the house upside down. He said he even ripped open pillows and blankets. Pillows and for blankets them. and mattresses and could not find them. So he says they are lost. That is the precursor for this section. Joseph went back to Harmony. There was nothing he could do. And um, the, uh, the angel appears to him because he is he's pouring out his soul to the Lord, trying to repent for making this horrible and egregious error. And he's out in the he's walking out and the angel appears and ha hands him the Urim and Thummim. He'd lost the Urim and Thummim. He'd taken it away from him, hands it to him. The Lord gives him a revelation through the Urim and Thummim. That's three. And then takes the Urim and Thummim back and, and the, the plates. plates. And the plates. So that's where we find ourselves here at the beginning of section three. Okay. There, yes, was, there was one thing that Joseph Smith, well, I mean, there's probably many things. But there's one thing that in particular he mentions he took away from having that experience with Martin. And that was that... He, whenever the Lord commanded, he would do. Right. And he wouldn't like, keep asking. When the Lord said, he would go. Yeah. So we're talking 1828, 1829. Joseph's 24, 25 years old. And so the Lord gives him some really interesting insights into himself. 
as he receives this section, right? So let's go let's go through this a little um, bit. Now that we know a little bit of the history. Yes, yeah. Joseph, do you want to share something else? No, about the section. Um, I really, really like verse one here. Yes. Because it talks about how the work of God cannot be frustrated by man. Yep. But man's works are frustrated. Yeah. One and three talk about that, right? Because he doesn't walk in crooked paths. And many times in the scriptures we're told everything that has been revealed, all the prophecies will be fulfilled in the Lord's time, in the Lord's way. Really important for all of us to remember the Lord's work will not be frustrated. Ours might. Ours might, but his will not. That's that's something really important to remember. Now, we get a, a little warning here in verse 4. And I, you guys know I love to look for formulas or patterns or warnings. equations in the scriptures. There's an equation here. It's the equation for what you have to do if you want to fall. That's <laughs> kind of a negative equation, right? Something you don't want to fulfill. But the important thing about this is that knowing what would cause one to fall can help you to know what not to do, right? Because he says right here, you know, although a man may have many revelations, Joseph had had that, and have power to do many mighty works. Okay, so those are some of the gifts Joseph had been given. Yet if he boasts in his own strength, so that's one thing, boasting in your own strength is an issue, pride, right? Sets at not the counsels of God doesn't do what Heavenly Father asks us to do, whether it's personal revelation, revelations from the scriptures, right? Follows after the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, doing what I want. And carnal desires meaning even pleasing our bodies over our spirits, right? If those three things are in, in place, he says, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. So we can't walk in pride. We cannot follow after our own desires and will. We cannot set it not the counsels of God. It doesn't matter what we've done in the past. If we fall down this path, we will lose our place. This is a warning to Joseph, but it's a warning to all of us to be very, very careful. And one of the things we're going to keep learning over and over and over again this year some really great men followed this path. Really great men. One of the things we're going to put together, and I don't know how quickly we'll get them done. We'll give you background on people as we go through, but we would like to put together at least some brief biographies of these people so that whenever you're reading through the Doctrine and Covenants and you want to know who is this person, what did they do, what was their end? How did they progress in their lives? Did they stay true and faithful? Did they follow this path? So we want to put together some biographies. We're not quite sure of the right structure yet or what things we want to include. So we're working on those. They probably will not come out as quickly as we go through some of these sections. But that is something we um, plan to have done as quickly as we can and getting them out hopefully by the end of the year. We'll put them out as we go, but hopefully all of them done <laughs> by the end of the year. So you guys got a lot of work ahead of you. This is a great language arts project, great research <laughs> project, great way to go through. Because part of what you're going to find is you're going to read somebody else's biography of these people and you're going to go look at their sources. You're going to have to determine were their sources good. Is their interpretation of their sources good? Vital for all of us to do when somebody else is telling the story. And that's why I keep turning you back to original sources, people who lived it, people whose lives it was. That's that's very important so that you know what really was happening. So there's our formula for failure. Um, <laughs> let's not follow that one, okay? Okay. <laughs> can, we, can we just agree to that? Yes. Yeah. Excellent, okay. excellent, thank you. <laughs> so then we get into more of the warning because he said you have transgressed the commandments and the laws of God. I just, it's hard for me to even imagine Joseph being that. But anytime we aren't being really just spot on straight path, we are transgressing and we have need to turn, right? That's repentance. And he says, you've gone on in the persuasions of men. So he's not staying on the right path. And you should not have feared man more than God. 
He says, men set at not the counsels of, disgu- of God and despise his word, yet you should have been faithful. Now, here's where one of our activities for the week comes in. Okay, I'm going to read it. I'm going to let you guys tell the activity because I think this will be an interesting activity to really have a good discussion with. You should have been faithful and he would have extended his arm and supported you against all the fiery darts of the adversary and he would have been with you in every time of trouble. What are we going to do? So what we're going to do is we're going to make some fiery darts. And then they're going to have target practice of me. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And we're going to let dad play the part of the protector. Right. So for us, we're going to use a window that we can open that has no screen. And we're going to have Joseph stand outside that window as we shoot our fiery darts at him. (laughs) And then dad's going to close the window. Because he's going to be faithful to his dad. And those darts are still going to be coming. He'll still see the trials and tribulations, but they won't hit him. They won't catch fire on top of me. (laughs) Because think of this beautiful promise here. Think of this promise. Fiery darts. He would have supported you against all the fiery darts of the adversary. That's, That's a blessing we all want, isn't it? That protection. All right. So that's one activity we would like to take care of this week. Now. These plates were written to help gather Israel, gather the Nephites, and gather the Lamanites. Nephites meaning that there were some righteous faithful that were probably drawn out somewhere, a righteous remnant, because the Lord has that pattern. He did it with Abraham. He did it with Lehi. He did it with Mosiah. He did it with Nephi. He did it with Alma, the elder. He has, he has this pattern of removing the righteous, and it's talked about all in the book of Ezekiel, that kind of pattern, Isaiah, Jeremiah. So the Lamanites would be, of course, those that were left. Nephites would be a righteous remnant withdrawn. They've got to be gathered, right? We're gathering Nephites too. So we're going to recommend that you go watch Nephites in Europe, put together by Joseph Smith Foundation. Some really fascinating information in there. Mm -hmm. But that's who's being written here because we've got to gather. We have to gather Israel. Nephites and Lamanites are part of Israel. They're a tribe of Joseph. The Americas are their promised land. Isn't that beautiful? So that pretty well sums up chapter three, unless somebody's got something to add to it. Anything? Okay, so a little more history before we get to four. Do you remember what happened before four? And who's two? Um, It's to Joseph Smith Sr. Right. They were coming to check on Joseph because they hadn't heard anything. Yeah, he left distraught and they haven't heard. So Mother Smith and Father Smith come to visit. And Joseph knows they're coming. (laughs) He had a vision. He knew they were coming. He says, Emma, I'm going to go meet Mother and Father. They're on their way to visit. (laughs) Imagine how weird that would be. Hey, I'm going to go see my parents. (laughs) Wait, what? (laughs) Did you get a letter? (laughs) No, Did you not tell me something was coming? <laughs> <laughs> and so she, he goes out to meet his parents and he says, don't worry, all is well. The Lord is, is I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to be able to do the work. And they come back in the house. His mother notices that there's Emma's trunk. And he says, yes, that's where the records are. The Lord has given me back the gift and the opportunity to translate. And the Urim and Thummim, not just the And the Urim and Thummim, right. So, and that's something you've got to remember. Many, many historians are trying to say that he didn't use the Urim and Thummim and the the plates to finish. Their resources are anti-Mormon literature. No one has said that he used a seer stone except some, an anti-Mormon or someone who apostatized from the church. Those are the only people in history who said he used those things. So another book that would be really good to read is the Seerstone versus the Urim and Thummim, written by Hannah Stoddard and James Stoddard. And I love the way they do this book because they don't tell you what to think. They lay all the facts out, all the sources out. You can go find the sources. As I went through the book, I'm on my computer and I'm typing it in and Googling it. And then I'm going directly to that source. I'm reading their sources. And I, I loved being able to do that because it was me doing the research for me. They laid it all in there. They laid the arguments out. And then they said, every member has to decide for themselves what they believe. Because we're kind of in a battle here for Joseph, for his character, for his story. 
Did he say what he said? Did he do what he did? Was he lying? Right? And so really, really important to know what the true history is. Very important. But while they're there, Joseph receives a revelation for his father. And that's what section four is. Now, what did you guys find in section four? Um, I know Emma really liked it. <laughs> well, there's some really good verses, but they're the last three verses. So. There are some really good verses at the end, but there's some good ones at the beginning. Yes. So, Emma really liked the embark part of it. Did you yeah, talk about embark, Emma, and what we want to do with that one? So... He's telling him to embark in the service of God. Mm -hmm. And so embark so in the service of God. So we're thinking for an activity this week that we will build a cardboard box boat. Or you can, if you choose to, draw your own boat and draw your family in it. Yep. Get embark, right? Mm -hmm. Get on the good ship Zion. <laughs> and so... That will be one of the activities we plan to do. That will be an activity. So we'll have some pictures on the blog. We'll put some things on Facebook. Hopefully these activities are helpful to you. If these activities are things that you're participating in, would you send pictures? Maybe if your kids finished coloring it or you've made your boat, we would love it if you would share your pictures of what you created or what you did, or if you act out the fiery darts, you know, maybe throw a quick video online or pictures of you doing it. Um, but we would like to see if you're, if these are helpful and fun and if the discussions are building your family. And what I have discovered is that, yes, these activities are great for young children, but they're good for teens, too. They are. And sometimes they're even good for grownups. So don't think you're too old for these activities <laughs> <laughs> because they kind of make you think about it in a different way. And we have a friend, Shelly, who's put together a Come Follow Me art for the heart and she's got a whole facebook page where she each week does an art project and but as you're creating something like that you're thinking about these things you've studied it really brings it into a different way so don't think that you're above these things <laughs> try them out you might just find that you learn something different from them but it's interesting because he says if you desire to serve you're called why is that do you think why does desiring to serve equal being called to the work? You're willing to work hard for it. Definitely a willingness. I totally agree. Are there any other thoughts you have about that? Anybody? Part of it's probably just like the spirit also telling you you should go. Cause... I think so too. I think the spirit works on those who are supposed to do something. Sometimes we want to do something really, really bad, but it maybe isn't a really good thing, right? But in this kind of a thing, if it's a good work and you're feeling a desire towards it, go to the Lord. Am I called to this? Is this something I'm supposed to do? But more than likely, if you're really feeling pulled to something that's a good thing, it is very possible it's because you're called to do that work. Don't you think, Dad? Absolutely. I think uh, one of the things, of course, that I learned from this particular one was when I went on a mission. Yeah. And it's kind of a missionary this, chapter. Yeah. <laughs> And the mission and the mission president told us, this is for us. Yeah. We should read this. Yeah. And so. Yeah, those are the verses Catherine really loved in this chapter. Yeah. <laughs> in this section. I like them too. Um, verses 5 through 7, we'll read them too. And it says, And faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God qualifieth him for the work. Now stop right there. Faith. Hope. hope Charity, Charity and, and love single. and an eye single to the glory of God. Those five things, charity and love, were not listed as being the same thing. That's really yeah. interesting. I've got to figure, I'm, I, I have a research project. Mm. <laughs> How are those two things different, right? Those five things qualify you for the work. So if you are doing the work of the Lord, you need to have faith, hope, charity, love, and an eye single to the glory of God. And then it says... Remember. Yep. Remember. Most important word in the scriptures, I think. Remember faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, <laughs> godliness, charity, humility, and diligence. So you're going to have those five things to qualify, but remember these other things. You mm -hmm. need these things too. They're the traits of Christ. They are the traits of Jesus Christ. And since we're trying to become like him, 
And everybody's work in reality is what? To bring to pass others and themselves to Christ. To Christ. Christ. To Christ. Right? To lift them as high as they will allow themselves to be lifted. And sometimes people don't want to be lifted very high. Sow the seeds and move on. <laughs> well, it's interesting because it's also what he says his work is. He says that his work is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Right. Our work is to assist. And then uh, finally, he gives uh, us a formula to receiving answers. Verse 7 says, Ask and you shall receive. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's something that's been given several times in the scriptures. That is a true formula. Ask and you shall receive. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And sometimes seek. ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock. Knock and but it shall be opened to you. That's another formula, by the way. I'll just let you work that one out on your own. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, section three was to Joseph through the Urim and Thummim. Section four was to was Joseph, to Joseph Sr. Senior. Was it through the Urim and Thummim? I don't remember. Most likely. I'll have to go back and look again. And section five is to Martin, Martin, Martin Harris, Harris at through, Harris. at his request, through Joseph. the Urim and Thummim, through Joseph Smith. But he used the Urim and Thummim to receive this revelation. So this is to Martin through the Urim and Thummim, from Joseph Smith. And it's really important here to recognize some things. First of all, Joseph made a covenant. He's getting chastised again, right? <laughs> Joseph made a covenant to care for these things. He did. And that's what he says. I have caused that you, Joseph, should enter into a covenant with me that you should not show them except to those persons to whom I commanded you. And you have no power over them, except I grant it unto you. Right? So he had made that covenant. Now, Martin is coming because he's desiring a witness of these things. He hasn't seen anything. He's felt drawn to Joseph. He's felt to help him. But he has not seen anything. And he wants a witness. He wants to see it. Can I see? Can I have some proof that I'm not wasting my time? That I'm not throwing my money at some wild, I mean, because Lucy's really unhappy with Martin, Lucy Harris. He's getting a lot of pressure from his wife. A lot of pressure. It caused a lot of difficulty in their marriage. I mean, she was so concerned at one point that she took all the, almost all the furniture out of the house and gave it to friends and acquaintances that she knew would take care of it because she was afraid it was all going to Joseph. Placed it in their care. She did not give it to them. So you got to be careful. She placed it in their, in their care, care because she right. knew she'd be able to get it back for them. She was so concerned that her husband was going to give everything to Joseph or something that she is. She's starting to hide things away and make the house not a very comfortable place to be. I mean, beds. <laughs> beds and furniture being secreted away at friends and relatives' houses. One of the things here that is also important not to neglect is verse 10. Yeah, we're going to get there really quickly. But before that, I want to talk about a couple of verses before. Go ahead. Because the Lord gives this as a warning. Because he said in verse 5, Woe shall come unto the inhabitants of the earth if they will not hearken unto my words, the Lord's words. And he says, Hereafter you'll be ordained to go forth and deliver my words. The only gift Joseph has right now is translation. That's the only work he's supposed to do. And he's told that in verse 4. He's like, don't pretend to any other gift because I'm right. not giving you one till you're done translating. So his whole work is to translate. Eventually, he's to go out and share with the world, right? And he's, he even talks about how, you know, if they won't believe my words, they won't believe your words, Joseph's words. Yeah. And so it, it, even if I showed these things unto the whole world, if they won't believe my words, they won't even believe it if they saw it. Seeing is not believing. That is a lie. That is a false thought and practice and, and theory. Not true. And Eva says this unbelieving and stiff-necked generation, my anger is kindled against them. And so nine leads into ten. And ten is the one we want to want to memorize this week. Because he says in nine, Verily I say unto you, I have reserved those things which I have entrusted unto you, Joseph, 
for a wise purpose in me, and it shall be made known unto future generations, semicolon. Joseph, what is our memorization scripture? Verse 10. And this says, but this generation shall have my words through you. Word through you. Okay. So what do we have? The Book of Mormon. What other of Heavenly Father's word do we have through Joseph Smith? The Pearl of Great Price. The Pearl of Great Price. The, the Joseph, Joseph Smith translation. translation of the Bible. The Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. So even Bible. And Doctrine, Doctrine and Covenants. Doctrine and Covenants. What else? Well, we have the history of the church by him. The history of the church by Joseph Smith. If you want to believe a history of the church, don't you think it ought to be Joseph's? If you don't believe Joseph's word, then none of the rest of this even makes any sense or has any meaning. What's the point? There would be no point, right? So this generation shall have my word through you. What does generation mean? Just those people living in Joseph's time? In this case, it means the entire dispensation. This dispensation. Yeah. And the Lord, even in 9, refers to some things that will be made known to future generations, meaning future dispensations. The millennium is a future dispensation. There will be more things revealed in the millennium. But what Joseph revealed is what we must know and do. Okay? He restored the gospel as follows. And then he says there will be three more witnesses. Those are the only ones that are going to have the spiritual witness of this. Joseph and three more witnesses. Four people. Four people get to witness for this. And then, Miranda, you're going to talk about verse 14 because you love this one so much. Um, okay. He talks about how none others like would, have, would get that privilege mm -hmm. of being able to bear this testimony. Right. And it talks about how this testimony is kind of like it's the church coming out of the wilderness. He talks about it's as clear as the moon, fair as the sun, and terrible as an army with its banners. Right. And I always love imagery in the scriptures. This is something you can truly picture and try to put into perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had somebody teach me once about scripture journals. And when she read these kinds of imagery or symbolism, in her scripture journal, she would actually illustrate them. That's why I'm so big on these projects and these other kinds of, of activities, because it just, it opens things up in a different way. And so the rising of the church out of the wilderness, clear as the, you read moon. it right? Moon. moon and fair as the sun. Did I get that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and terrible as an army with banners. That's the rise of the church out of the wilderness which is a reference back to Revelation. When it talked about the church being driven into the wilderness. What is that being driven to the wilderness? What's another word we have for that? Wouldn't it be like apostasy? The great apostasy after the uh, original 12 apostles, how it went into apostasy. So coming out of the wilderness. Now, there's an interesting thing here in 16 and 17. You guys remember, take a look there at 16 and 17. What is that referring to? Baptism. Baptism and the priesthood. Oh, priesthood. That the priesthood will come. He says, but you are not yet ordained. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a little foreshadowing of what's coming, right? You're not yet ordained. I think that's really interesting. Well, and there is more foreshadowing later in this section that I think is interesting. In 21 and 22, he talks to Joseph and says, if you will walk more uprightly before me, and repent repent what's the point and have no more yield no more yield no more uh to the persuasions of men mm -hmm. and keep all of the commandments which he has been given and previous commandments that have been given mm -hmm. he will have eternal life even if he is slain right so a foreshadowing that he would give his life like the savior had to like many of the original apostles did, and even many of the original Christians, giving their lives as martyrs for the cause. 18, 19, and 20 give us a little bit of interesting thing, too, is that because those three witnesses will be also testifying of this work, and so theirs is a warning to this, this generation, and he warns that there is a desolating scourge coming forth. It shall continue to be poured out from time to time if they repent not, until the earth is empty. 
and the inhabitants thereof are consumed away and utterly destroyed by the brightness of my coming. And he told this to them just the same way as he forewarned the people in Jerusalem that they would have a desolating destruction. And they did. It was awful, 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 awful. And so that's what we have here is this warning is to the world. Their witness is a warning. Now he talks about Martin. What, Joseph? Well, I just wouldn't like the words he used in <laughs> the be in my case. But he was a wicked man. He broke a covenant. He broke a covenant. He was a wicked man. He needed to repent. And the Lord tells him so. You yeah. need to. The Lord says that he may be a witness if he will repent of his wrongdoings. Mm -hmm. And be humble. And the Lord tells him, this is what you're going to say. And you will say nothing else. Only these words. That's what he gives in here in these verses between, 20, between 23 and 29. So that's really, really important. The only thing he's to say. I have seen them. They have been shown unto me by the power of God. And these are the words which he shall say. And if he denies that, he's going to break another covenant and will be condemned. So Martin has to humble himself. We all have to be humble. We have to watch out for that pride. We have to watch out because Martin fell to that pride. He did. He was later excommunicated from the church. Spent a long time away from the main body of the church. He actually lived in Kirtland. Say? Martin. Martin. He actually yeah. lived in Kirtland for a lot of years after the saints had gone west. He, he and Lucy ended up not staying together. And after her death, he married Brigham Young's niece and had many children with her. But they were not with the main body of the saints. They were in Kirtland. He considered himself the caretaker for the Kirtland temple. He would take people through and and testify and he he dabbled in lots of different churches and everything but he, he he didn't deny his testimony but he wasn't really very faithful but he did in the end um go out to salt lake and and lived here in utah for the last years of his life and anybody who would come he would tell the story of seeing the plates i have seen them they have been shown unto me by the power of god and so he did come back, but he spent a long time away because he struggled so much with this humility. He thought he should have better position than he had. Wow, we really have to be careful of that, don't we? Don't we? Yeah. Ending here, 30 to 33, Joseph needs to stop for a little while. Let's take a look at that. I thought that was very interesting in verse 30. Because mm -hmm. the Lord tells him, you've translated all I want you to translate for a little bit. Take a break. Yep. And then you'll translate again. And why does he tell him he needs to do that? He's told to stop. Yeah. You've done some for a little bit. It also talks about how his enemies lay waiting for him so that they can destroy him. Mm -hmm. And so the Lord is asking him to stop so he, that he'll be safe. Yeah. He also gives a little foreshadowing for Martin Harris. I foresee. What does he foresee? If he doesn't humble himself and... Receive the witness of the hand that he will fall into transgression. Okay. And then he tells him one more time. There are many that lie in wait to destroy thee from off the face of this earth. And for this cause that thy days may be prolonged, I have given unto thee these commandments. You're, you're waiting for a season because there are those who would like to destroy you. And your, his time wasn't over, right? He hadn't done the work, so he needs to be obedient. And he was obedient to that. Now, these last two verses... Are a couple of promises to Joseph. Who was it that brought those out earlier? I'd like you to talk about that. Was it you, Miranda? Yeah. I liked this repetition. It reminded me of First Nephi 3-7. Mm -hmm. Because it talks about the Lord telling Joseph that he needed to stop and stand still until he was commanded to move forward again. Mm -hmm. And that the Lord would prepare a way. Mm -hmm. And he was also given the promise that if he was faithful and kept the commandments, that he would be lifted up in the last day. Yeah. Exactly. And we actually all have that promise. 
if we can be faithful and keep the commandments in their fullness, we too can be lifted up at the last day, right? Very important. The reason that sh- that you thought this fit so well with First Nephi 3, 7, it says that thou mayest accomplish the thing which I have commanded thee. <laughs> so yeah. That's almost a word for word. And I, I'm not sure where he was in the translation portion, but I don't think that he maybe had even translated this yet, or maybe he had, maybe it was on the 116 pages. That is one thing that I found this week in um, Essentials in Church History by Joseph Fielding Smith is what was on those missing pages, where it came from. So he says here, the lost manuscript contained the abridgment made by Mormon of the record of Nephi from Lehi um, to the reign of King Benjamin or the words of Mormon in the Book of Mormon. So when he made that abridgment, remember that Mormon talks about, I feel like I'm supposed to put these other small plates. They they contain a lot of things that I really love. I'm going to put them with this book. That's, and it had actually better things on it than those first 116 pages. Of course, the Lord Mm -hmm. would preserve like the better part, right? And, (laughs) And so that, so it really, both of them came from the plates of Nephi. Mormon had abridged the large plates and included the small plates. So when Joseph was called to translate again, he was told to translate up until King Benjamin. And then he would go on with the other portion. And so that's where those, that is what was on those lost manuscript pages. Now we're going to finish out our day with faith in every footstep for a couple of reasons. It's important to have that faith, but also because it talks about embarking in the service of God, right? All right. Captain, will you give us that E flat? One, two, three. A marvelous work has begun to come forth among all the children of men. O ye that embark in the service of God, give heart, mind, and strength unto him. For prophets have spoken and angels have come to rid the world from sin. That Christ may reign over all the earth and bless his gathered kin with faith in every footstep. We follow Christ the Lord. If you've liked our videos, give us a thumbs up and subscribe. And don't forget to hit the bell for notifications. Also, find and follow us on Facebook.